Hello and welcome to the third installment of the East Hampton Historical Society's Winter Lecture Series. I'm Steve Long, Executive Director of the Historical Society. This evening, once again, I am filling in for our series organizer and host, Barbara Borsak. I hope she'll be back next month uh, for our final presentation. During this year's winter lecture series, we've been celebrating the centennial of the East Hampton Historical Society's founding by looking at the histories of the museums and historic sites that we interpret. This evening, we'll be learning about early schools and education in East Hampton, which of course features the Historical Society's headquarters, Clinton Academy. And I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker, David Cataletto, an East Hampton native and member of the Historical Society's Education Committee. David teaches sixth grade history at East Hampton Middle School. After receiving a bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a master's in education from City College, David began his teaching career at PS 41 in Manhattan and then moved back to teach in East Hampton in 2011. Newly elected as an East Hampton town trustee, David serves as a trustee of the Amagansett Life Saving Station Museum and the East Hampton Nature Preserve Committee. He lives in the Northwest Woods with his wife and two young children. I know many of you know him well, so please, everyone, join me in welcoming David. Hello, class. Good to see you all seated neatly and quietly. Remember not to speak without permission, or you might be out chopping wood in the cold until noon bell. Now, today's lesson will be on the rich history of education in our fair town of East Hampton. And, um, well, there will be a test on this material, so take good notes. Now, if your quill pens are sharpened, I'll begin. Seriously, though, folks, thanks so much for joining me tonight. My name is David Cataletto, and I grew up around the corner from here, went through our great school system, now teach sixth grade, as Steve said. Um, and I'm also honored to be an East Hampton Town trustee. Thanks to the East Ham Historical Society for inviting me here tonight. I feel honored. And I've been inspired and educated about the incredible past of our town from attending these talks for many years. I was kind of hoping this chat would be at Clinton Academy, um, like it used to be, since we would have been sitting in the actual school that I'll be talking about in a little bit. But anyway, we're close enough, just a few doors down the street from the famous academy. We are still together in another important building of knowledge in our community. The East Hampton Library certainly goes hand in hand with the education of our town. Town trustees have been one of the original governing bodies in East Hampton since its beginning. Mostly the trustees have governed the lands and bodies of water here, but the trustees were also responsible for founding and financing our earliest schools. So being an East Hampton teacher and trustee, I'd like to think I have a connection with our topic tonight. But really, we all do. All of us have the common experience of education and schooling. And we all remember those moments of inspiration and frustration. So tonight, picture yourself in the shoes of those students you'll hear about, or within the walls of the schools I'll describe. And I hope somewhere along the way that picture comes alive in your mind. And you can see how it was. And if you're here tonight, it means you've continued that quest for knowledge, and I commend you. I'll do my best to take you through an abbreviated history of early education in East Hampton, including the different school buildings spread from Wayne Scott to Montauk, with a focus on Clinton Academy. I say abbreviated because, really, a lecture could be spent on each of the five districts. Now, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge that before the first colonists set foot on these shores, the native population living here would have been educating their own children for millennia. The Montaukets and Shinnecocks would have educated the younger generation how not only to survive, but to thrive in this rich land. From farming to hunting and fishing, these lessons were passed down orally through the spoken word as there wasn't a written language 
for the tribes of the Algonquin Nation. Some of these lessons were subsequently taught to the first settlers of East Hampton. In fact, if we are talking about early education in East Hampton, we can't forget that the local indigenous people were probably the first real educators for the early settlers here, teaching them countless skills from fishing techniques, hunting whales, and farming the three sisters. Powerful native medicinal remedies from local plants and herbs were quickly picked up by the English colonists, saving many lives. Without this education from the Montauk, Shinnecock, and other local tribes, things would have been much more difficult for those first risky settlers dropping anchor in Northwest Harbor. Now, the standard of education in the mid to late 1600s in the colonies was not very high. These rugged and innovative early men and women initially put more importance to cultivating land and sea. Experts with plows and muskets, axes and looms, these first few families, the original Bonnikers, eventually learned to thrive off these rich lands. In these early beginnings, boys had to do their chores first. Do livestock, cut firewood all year long, farming, fishing, and whaling spring, summer, and fall. In the winter, which was the slack season, they were allowed a little schooling. Girls helped their mothers around the house and were not expected to do much book learning. Early teachers were mostly parents or older family members. The Bible was the most important book in the home, and early education at its most basic was to learn rules and scripture. However, it seems that education in East Hampton had an equal or higher standard than the rest of the northern colonies. Although children's help was needed in the fields and on the water, early schooling began at home. And limited though they were, public records show that colonists here were highly acquainted with their political rights and kept a watchful eye on keeping them. This freedom of thought is, after all, why so many settlers left England and other European countries in the first place. It seems that East Hampton citizens have always been an independent and liberal-minded group that cherished the freedoms they held in the somewhat isolated colony, surrounded by their rivals, the Dutch, and the fragile Native American alliances. This spirit of independence later led many of its men to join the American Revolution. Because these Stampton citizens knew enough from their education that they did not want to have to bow down to a monarchy, these students would grow up with the knowledge of the world around them and what they should be entitled to. These ideas and philosophies that were fostered in academia led to an enlightened citizenship. And even though Long Island was occupied by the British during the Revolution, our forefathers never gave up their independence of thought. These innovative people had an eye towards intellect and staying in form, more so than other colonies, as we will see later, when East Hampton founded the first academy in New York that included women. Imagine for a moment you are a child in early America. What does education look like for you? In large part, the answer to that question rests in who you were. Back then, education was determined by class, race, and gender. The lower working class and minorities didn't have much time for schooling. Instead, they joined apprenticeships or on the job training under the supervision of an experienced master. These apprenticeships usually lasted three to seven years and taught the apprentice the ins and outs of a trade. For example, if you were a poor boy in colonial America, you might become a blacksmith's apprentice, learning how to be a blacksmith by working for one. After a certain number of years, you would be skilled enough to open your own blacksmith shop. For children from wealthier families, education took the form of tutoring or working one-on-one -on -one in small groups with a higher teacher. What about the children who were in the middle economically? They would most likely be sent to a dame school usually run by a woman, hence the name. And this is an early rendition of a dame school. Children would be sent to a local woman's house to be taken care of and learn the basic ABCs and some math. This would happen while the woman still prepared her daily duties of cleaning and cooking. In the earliest times when paper was scarce, kids traced letters using chalk on slate or even in the ashes near the fire. Now, in 1848, 34 families founded the town of Maidstone, soon to be renamed East Hampton. Most of these original settlers had large families. It seems that from the earliest times, East Hampton residents were deeply concerned with the importance of education. Founding fathers had the first school built in 1652. 
It also served as a meeting house, and it was small, 26 feet by 20 feet, with a straw-thatched roof and a chimney. It stood in the center of the village where Town Pond and the cemetery meet today. This was built with contributions and taxes from the community. In its first year, there were 23 students ranging from 7 to 14 years old. The first teacher, this isn't really him, Charles, <laughs> Charles Bronson, <laughs> was paid 30 pounds sterling per year. Records show that half of this was paid by a small tax on residents, and the other half of each student paid as tuition. Mr. Bronson sounded like a tough guy. The records from that time say he was a man of strong disciplinary measures enforced by physical means if necessary. As one incident proves when, on July 6, 1655, a student, Daniel Fairfield, who would go on to give the town fathers a great deal of trouble, whacked another student during a lesson. So Mr. Bronson took hold of him about the collar and thrust him backwards under the bench. After more punishment, Daniel fled from the school. Back then, teachers seemed to have an almost unrestrained arsenal of punishments for unruly students. Discipline in schools back then could be savage. For example, if a student wasn't listening to the teacher, he or she could get an ear washing with a hot corn cob, or a student had to go outside to cut their own branch, which they were then beaten with. Boys were hit on their bare behinds. Girls were wrapped on the knuckles. Other consequences involved sitting farthest from the fire in winter, chopping wood, or even being locked in a closet. And the list went on. In my sixth grade class, the worst I do to unruly students is give them detention. <laughs> uh, maybe they needed all the help they could get, though. Because imagine the challenge of a small one-room school packed with students of all ages. Imagine elementary kids with teenagers all in the same room. These early teachers must have been good at juggling the different lessons and keeping some groups busy and quiet while teacher teaching others. The school day usually began with the ringing of a bell at 8 a.m. Excuse me. Lunch was from 11 to 1. School finished at about 5. Students went to school six days a week, half day on Saturday. Just like today, school was closed snowstorms, hurricanes, and other natural disasters. However, there was one reason school might be closed, which definitely doesn't happen today. Whales. Whales? <laughs> because of the South Fork strategic location sticking out into migrating pods of whales, drift and offshore whaling was a thriving industry in early East Hampton. This lucrative income at their doorstep caused East Hampton, East Hampton to be a somewhat richer settlement than other early colonies in New England. This extra income, no doubt, played a part in East Hampton's early emphasis on education. Whaling was such an important industry that records show when a whale was either found on the beach, called drift whaling, or later harpooned offshore, school was closed for a day or two, and students were expected to help butcher and harvest the whale. I think it's kind of interesting to think, uh, you know, you picture these teachers and the students all down there getting bloody and greasy and uh, but I wonder if the students enjoyed the math lessons or the the well you know butchering <laughs> I don't know um, I, so, um, it was also such a big industry that oh, the whole town took part and I found again and again in my research particularly in those early years that students tuition was often paid in whale oil whale bones baleen and other parts of the whale other records show that in addition to whale parts, early students also paid tuition in beef, pork, hides, tallow, butter, even shellfish and dried fish. In 1682, the first school consisted of 29 students. A line from the town record says, the great importance of education and the necessity of competent teachers was a subject which had very seriously occupied the minds of the trustees and their efforts and that of the colonists had successfully been devoted to the maintenance of a sufficient school. It seems they were never without a teacher for long. In the following years, as East Hampton grew, eventually the first school was too small and a new school called the Hook School was built in 1739. The one-room schoolhouse was bigger and better built than the first and was also used for town meetings. Um, you can see a replica of this now next to Clinton Academy. It was originally down the street on the corner of the Gardner property. Here's a look inside. Students sat along the sides, um, and you can visit this in the summer it's open. And here are some of the tools students would, would use, actually, here 
here is, um, I found this old photograph. And it says that this is the, this is the Methodist church. This is from the back, kind of from the beach side looking. And this is a uh, carriage shed for the Methodist church. Uh, and then this is an old town building. This is a hook mill. So it was also here that they, they moved it. Um, the next school was no, oh, here are some tools that uh, students would have used. Here's a slate. This was really uh, used in the beginning mostly with, before paper became regular quill pen, and this was a, a type of a, a book with alphabet and you know, probably some um, the Lord's Prayer and some scripture probably. Uh, these, are, these are called um, horn books, and these are really popular in early schools. It was just a, um, basically a piece of wood with a handle, and you could attach ABCs or the Lord's Prayer, so students would use that to So the townhouse, um, the next school was known as the townhouse, was built in 1785, also sits next to Clinton Academy today. Among, unique among Long Island buildings, the townhouse is the only existing town government meeting place to survive from the colonial period on Long Island and the earliest surviving one-room schoolhouse on Long Island. Town trustees who met there determined the affairs of the township by collecting taxes, passing local laws, administering public lands, maintaining the church, the schoolhouse, and hiring minister and teacher. Studies were very basic, reading, writing, and enough math to keep an accounts book. Early teachers rarely had a very extensive education. And there were virtually no textbooks in the beginning or paper in use. Learning was accomplished by copying on slate. After 1845, the building continued to be used as a meeting place for the town trustees. It was later used as a barber shop, interior design studio. Um, etc. 1958, the East Ham Historical Society acquired uh, the townhouse and moved it next to Clinton Academy. All right, so let's take a moment and visit some of the other schools that were popping up across East Hampton. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the inside of the townhouse. All right, so here are our school districts, and you can see we've got Wayne Scott, East Hampton. Uh, Gardner's Island was, they had a school there and it was actually part of Springs. And originally, Sag Harbor, because there wasn't much of a population, they went to school in the Northwest. So that, that was the sixth, there was actually a sixth district back then. And today they're pretty much along those same lines, I believe. All right, so Northwest Harbor today is a pretty quiet place. In fact, my three year old son and I walked the beach there this afternoon and didn't see a soul. Alone, let alone a boat. But back in the day, it was a bustling commercial center, even in winter, with wharves, shipbuilding, a sawmill, fish factory, and big sprawling farms. It was, after all, the first port for East Hampton, and many families lived and worked there. The first schoolhouse we know about was built in the Northwest in 1725. The original one room school house is located near the entrance to what is now Cedar Point Park. A line from the Journal of the Trustees by the clerk in 1725 states, made the Northwest schoolhouse warm and fit for the winter freeze. It was rebuilt by Henry Dominey in 1792. In 1827, it was relocated and refurbished to where you can still see the foundation today. It was called the Van Scoy School since it was on Van Scoy land. In return, the family asked for six cents a year plus all the ashes from the school fireplace, which was used as fertilizer. The one room wooden structure could hold 30 to 40 students. Uh, this is located near the old Northwest Cemetery and Northwest Road. I recommend checking this place out. It's a beautiful little glen with hiking trails and other interesting historical sites. Miss Mary E. Van Scoy taught for a number of years here. The school was abandoned in 1885 for lack of enrollment. The Northwest Settlement had been in decline since Sag Harbor built Long Wharf and became the preferred port for its deeper waters. Before the Northwest School closed, there was originally six districts. All right, now we're going to Wainscott. Another school was built in Wainscott in June 1730. That's, that's not this one. <laughs> this one-room schoolhouse was right next to where the school is today. It was rebuilt in 1796, the year the state legislature passed an experimental act to establish schools with public funding. In 1826, there was a tragedy. 
The old schoolhouse was burning, leaping flames quickly consuming oak and shingles as sparks lit up the night sky. Osborne's, Hands, Strong's, and Edwards's, all wainscot hurried towards the blaze. But in the early 19th century, there was no fire hydrants and no fire department was at the ready. The hastily organized bucket line had little chance of smothering the flames. Local legend claims that a disgruntled student had set the fire in the dark of night. It was rebuilt on the site it sits today, and this is an old photo of the second house. In 1884, the third school was built in 1906. The third school was built. It's kind of a beautiful little school. It's also the church. In 1907, Judge Hedges described the schoolhouse as a community center. The village seine net was stored in the loft, and it served as the first church. Three generations had worshiped there. It was the center of schooling, center of fishermen's meetings, center of religious worship. Now we're going to Amagansett. So this is the, um, one of the original schoolhouses in Amagansett. It now sits in front of the school. So you can visit it today in the summer. They have hours. You can peek in the windows. Um, so this was built in 1802 by Samuel Schellinger. Uh, basically, it was built across the street from where the school is today. Um, oh, here's a look inside. It's from the uh, 1800s. There's some students sitting with their classmates. The desks also were benches. They're like bench desks. Um, so then this was moved to where the tennis courts are today, and it was eventually auctioned off to Joshua Edwards, who used it to store fishing gear and equipment. Um, and it was eventually donated back to the school uh, where you can see it today. Um, here's another Amagansett school, 1881, <clears throat> I believe. Quote on the rock in front of this schoolhouse, um, which I like, um, and it's written by Albert Einstein, who visited Amagansett in the 1940s. It says, learn from yesterday, live for today, and hope for tomorrow. So the, the current schoolhouse is a Georgian-style building that was opened in 1936. Um, I don't actually have one of that, but you probably all know the school. On a side note, during the last two years of the COVID pandemic, enrollment doubled in Amagansett. And in fact, enrollment has ballooned in all the East Hampton school districts since the pandemic 20, 2020. All right, we're going to Springs. Springs built its first schoolhouse in February 1784. East Hampton Town Trustees authorized the building of a schoolhouse on the north side of the town. This is, this is not it. Now, the second schoolhouse, which also served as a place of worship, opened in 1807 at the corner of Fireplace Road and Old Stone Highway. So that's uh, where we are here. The third schoolhouse was built in 1847 known as the Little Red Schoolhouse. And that was a part of this original Ashwan Hall. I think it would basically kind of look like that. I couldn't find any photos of that. Um, it was sold to the Spring Historical Society in 1909 for $1 and is now part of Ashawa Hall. And Ashawa Hall is the Montauk word for, does anyone know? A place between. A place between, yes, Aline, and also a, it's also known as a meeting place. All right, so the fifth schoolhouse, oh, and also um, a lot of the times schools were built near churches because in the beginning they went hand in hand. That was, you know, the earliest lessons when you were studying scripture, you'd learn to read so you could read the Bible. So a lot of um, schools were near churches like Clinton Academy. And a little side note, my parents were married right in that church right there. All right. So the fifth schoolhouse was the first school on the current School Street site. It was a wooden two-story building with four classrooms and what is described as one of the prettiest school buildings of its size in the country. And here it is right here. Unfortunately, the building burned to the ground in 1929. A lot of fires back then. Possibly due to an overheated chimney. Here's the same building. This was one of the last probably pictures all the students escaped unhurt. 
It was during the school day. But legend has it that a teacher's tears over the loss of a cherished piano that was left inside rallied three brave boys to go back into the burning building and successfully rescue the beloved instrument. I was thinking maybe those courageous boys were here somewhere. <laughs> it's probably when the last picture is taken. Uh, today's spring school is the sixth schoolhouse of the district and opening in 1931. Now, does anyone know the spring school mascot? Osprey, yes, which is appropriate as Akabonic Harbor is right across the street. And occasionally, live, bloody fish escape from an osprey's talons and plummet into the spring school playground <laughs> full of kids. And I've seen it happen when I was uh, playing tennis there. Yeah. Um, the local boys just they either take it home for lunch or they uh, <laughs> throw it in the woods. All right, so this is something I learned definitely from this. Gardner's Island, much like Northwest, Har Northwest Harbor, was once a bustling community that also has faded into history. At one point, there were hundreds of people working on the island in a number of industries, including farming, livestock, fishing, and wool production from the huge herds of sheep. They were famous for the Gardner's wool. All right, so included in this population were the Bound Boys. This is the Bound Boys uh, house right here where they would stay. Um, these were young boys and men indentured to the garden plantation by their families, typically as a way to pay off debts. These boys were encouraged to attend schooling in the winter. Records show there was a school on the island which later fell under the jurisdiction of Springs. In 1885, Emma Louise Edwards started teaching on Gardner's Island at the age of 16. Paid by the Spring School District, her salary was $25 uh, to teach her in the summer term and $35 in the winter for grades uh, first through eighth in one room. One bound boy, James Stewart, gave Mrs. Edwards a pin made from an arrowhead he found on the beach for teaching him to read and write. So I couldn't really find a specific photo of the school. You know, maybe it was one of these, but I also found this picture, this photograph. Um, and it wasn't, didn't really have a label on it, it says just somewhere on Gardner's Island. So I don't know, I thought that kind of looked like a school. So maybe that's the one room schoolhouse. I don't know, maybe someone here knows. But that's, what I'm, that's my guess. All right, next up, what's left? Montauk. Montauk, yeah, Will. All right. Montauk was the last school district to be formed as for centuries, the most remote of East Hampton's hamlets. The population was low consisting of mostly seasonal fishermen and cowboys who shepherded the large herds of cattle and horses. Does anyone know the Montauk mascot? Mustang. That's right, Mustang from those original uh, herds of cattle and horses. And that's another whole lecture. Um, on October 5th, 1896, Montauk's first school, op oh, there it is, at Second House, uh, with Miss Martha Osborne of Wainscott as teacher. Classes were held in a wing off the kitchen with about a dozen Montauk students in attendance. Second house also had rooms for boarders, like a modern day B&B. &B. So can you imagine these local kids doing lessons near where dinner was being cooked up for some of the first vacationers from New York City? <laughs> Classes were held there until a schoolhouse at Hither Hills, Montauk was opened in 1900. Um, and it was called the Little Red Schoolhouse. There was a lot of Little Red Schoolhouses. And taught children of the children of fishermen from Fort Pond, uh, Fort Pond Bay and life-saving station men of Hither Plains and Ditch Plains. In 1919, the second school was erected a little bit bigger below the Montauk Inn, um, and which eventually became part of the Montauk Firehouse over on that side. Montauk's, Montauk's third school, the one in use today, on the Great Hill, as it was called, was built in 1928. The school is supposedly inspired by Carl Fisher's architectural vision of Montauk, the Miami of the North. Here's a quote from the East Hampton Star, October 19, 1928. Montauk can now boast a brand new school with an auditorium that seats 450 people. The school is an architectural achievement built by Pearson Construction, a local company that has delivered a world-class center for learning. Everybody in town wants a tour. And they did host a huge opening ceremony that uh, was attended by most of the, the town. All right, so let's go back again to 
East Hampton village. Throughout the history of this town, there were various people and groups who looked out for the interests of the poor and lower class youth who lacked opportunities for a better education. Late 1700s, one of the more famous was the well-to-do English sea captain, William J. Rysom, who chose East Hampton's Clinton Academy as the best place to educate his six motherless daughters. Captain Rysom married Phoebe Hunting Miller and settled in Sag Harbor and had a very successful shipbuilding business. Throughout his life, the captain gave money to help educate the poor. When he died in 1813, he left a $500 fund for the education of needy children in East Hampton. To this day, the East Hampton trustees still administer scholarships with the interest from these funds. And over the past 200 years, hundreds of children have benefited from Captain Rysom's generosity. Clinton Academy would probably never have existed if it wasn't for the defeat of the English in the American Revolution. Here's what happened. A year after the Redcoats, Redcoats surrendered at Yorktown, New York's Governor George Clinton declared, neglect of the education of youth is among the evils and consequences of war. Perhaps there is scarcely anything more worthy of our attention than the revival and encouragement of schools of learning. You see, during the years of the revolution and those leading up to it, education in the colonies had been partially neglected. The governor's words inspired East Hampton's Reverend, Reverend Samuel Buell to construct the first Academy of Learning in 1784. Originally called the East Hampton Academy, the name quickly changed after New York Governor Clinton made the trip to East Hampton for the dedication and gifted the school a famous large bell. This bell had a long history before it reached our town. For over 100 years, it had hung in, the, in a church in downtown Manhattan. In 1775, George Washington had this bell, among others, removed from churches in downtown New York and shipped to an iron foundry in Pennsylvania to be melted down into musket and cannonballs for the fight against the British. But in 1783, it was discovered that somehow the bell still remained and it was turned over to Governor Clinton and then to the new academy in East Hampton. So instead of a weapon of war, it became a beacon of hope. The Academy was constructed in 1784, only a year after the British left Long Island. It was built with funds contributed by local citizens at the request of Reverend Samuel Buell, pastor of the East Hampton Presbyterian Church. It's soon to be the first headmaster of Clinton Academy. Buell graduated from Yale College in 1765 and was inspired by the beautiful buildings on campus there. Here is a building that he would have gone to. This is on Yale campus, and this is the, called Connecticut Hall. And you can see it's a, you know, a bit more grander, a bit bigger, but it has the same style architecture. Just this is a bit downscale. So he was inspired by Yale. He wanted East Hampton to be inspired. So they built it very similar. And also, Harvard has similar buildings. Academy holds the distinction of being the first chartered academy in New York State by the Board of Regents, therefore the oldest in New York State. But our little academy, uh, besides being the first academy of higher learning in New York State, also was one of the only co-educational schools in America, America, offering classes to young women beyond basic elementary lessons. Women were rarely given the opportunity for education in early America, but not so in liberal-minded East Hampton. The Academy ran from roughly first grade to 12th grade. In today's standards, and completion would have been the equivalent of a high school diploma, with some classes considered college level, or as we call them today, AP, or International Baccalaureate. The war for independence was still fresh in everyone's mind, and maybe never before in history was education in for such a dramatic change. It was an age of exuberant faith in the power and possibility of education in this new young nation. In 1785, Noah Webster wrote, the goal of education was nothing less than a new Republican individual, a virtuous character, abiding patriotism, and prudent wisdom, fashioned by education into an independent yet loyal citizen. And without such individuals, this experiment in liberty would be short-lived at best." End quote. Trying to say is 
The revolution did not guarantee the future of our country, but the task of maintaining that foundation became the important role of education. The Academy opened its doors for classes on January 1st, 1785. The first principal was William Payne, father of the famous John Howard Payne, the author of Home Sweet Home. The founders of Clinton Academy designed a curriculum with three basic departments. Common School Department, the English Acad Academical Department, and the Classical Department. Also, because of East Hampton's close proximity to the bustling international port of Sag Harbor, many men were attracted to life at sea. So there were classes in ocean studies, world geography, and celestial navigation. Students learned to use the sextant, charts, terrestrial globe, and other tools of the sailor. Many students did go to sea and had the opportunity to test their skills and to see the world they had learned about at the academy. A few would become famous captains of whale boats and commercial vessels that crisscrossed the globe at years at a time. George Brown, an alumni of the academy, was captain of the whale ship Ontario at Sag Harbor for 10 years before being killed by a whale in 1850 off Hawaii. In general, the wealthier a family was, the further your education extended. The upper class boys after graduating would most likely attend a college in America but might also sail across the Atlantic for England to enroll at Oxford or Cambridge. There were 56 pupils in 1788, and 10 years later, in 1798, the academy had more than doubled with 121 students. Of these, about half were day pupils or local kids, and half were boarders from out of town who stayed in nearby homes with local families, paying for room and board. Young men also occasionally boarded in the attic of the academy as evidenced by graffiti on the ceiling dating from the 1850s. Because of its growing fame and recognition, students came from New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut, and soon all up and down the East Coast. Some youth came as far away as the islands of the Caribbean and probably sailed on ships carrying kegs of molasses and rum to the port of Sag Harbor. Every night at 9 p.m., the famous bell was rung from the high belfry, signaling all students should be at home for the night. The Academy's greatest year, 1850, 1815, attracted 156 students. Most students would have walked to school, but some students rode horses that would be left to graze in the paddock around back or hitched up in front. One student, Jonas Miller, recalled riding with both his sisters on his family's horse for many years to make the commute from their home near Lily Pond each day. So that's three to the fact that Clinton Academy was built directly across from the main street um, from the Presbyterian Church is clear evidence of the relationship of religious instruction to academic study. Students were required to attend daily morning and evening services at church. In the 18th and 19th century mind, this was not considered a breach of the new nation's separation of church and state. The Bible was joined by other important widely read school books such as Pilgrim's Progress, the New England Primer, Isaac Watts' Divine Songs, and Tac Tacitus, a famous Roman author. As it is today, music was a cherished part of school in East Hampton. Mostly hymns were sung, but there were other little ditties recited to help students learn lessons. Teachers played violins, flutes, and later piano to accompany their students. As, students in the, as noted in the academy records, Mary Bennett played a contagious violin, and as students watched their teachers dancing fingers, they pushed their voices to meet her, daring each other, it seemed. So I looked into popular songs. What do you think popped up? Yankee Doodle. It's a big cliche, but class, we're going to just do the first verse <laughs> together. All right, so sing with me. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. Stuck a feather in his cap, called it macaroni. I can't hear you. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle, dandy, mind the music. Step and with the girls be handy. All right, good singing. Nice. You guys, no homework, no homework for you tonight. You did really well. Excuse me. Um, in early July, at the academy, always on the last day of school, there was a huge ceremony and gathering of the community called Exhibition Day. The girls brought flowers to decorate the main room, and everyone was dressed their best. Principal and top students gave speeches, read poetry, the girls sang songs. There was always a spelling match where the younger students had a chance to shine. 
Exhibition Day also served as an advertisement to attract new students for the coming semester. The principal gave out awards to the winners of categories uh, such as most studious, most prompt, best attendance, um, just like they do today in yearbooks, right? I want to share a few lines from the class valedictorian John Brush's oration speech from 1786. The penmanship was really beautiful. I, you know, I saw this in the Long Island collection. <clears throat> Respectable auditors, sensible of my inability to furnish you with anything new or entertaining, either from eloquence or sentiment, I shall not attempt to define any particular topic, but only endeavor to give some general hints at the advantages arriving from a virtuous education. As you can hear, the use of vocabulary is excellent. I read the rest of the speech, and it's filled with flowery prose, but also lots of sarcasm and wit and hidden humor. So they had a lot of fun back then. John Brush went on to study at Yale as well as a good percentage of the academy students. In school back then, just like today, there's always a handful of class clowns and pranksters. There might be a few in this room. <laughs> Here's one such case from 1859, recalled by Mary Mulford Miller. The day I remember best during all my academy schooling was one winter day when at noon recess, the boys stuffed paper up the chimney. We returned to school to find the room full of smoke. Study was impossible. The bewildered and smoke-blinded teacher could do nothing but dismiss school for the day. We really considered it one of the strange acts of providence that just as we were dismissed, Nat Dominey should appear with his father's horse team and a hay wagon filled with straw. We all climbed merrily in and went for winter greens in northwest woods. Suspicions have given way to conviction that Nat was one of the boys who stuffed the paper up the chimney. During recess, uh, students would go home, and go home or to the houses they boarded at for lunch. Also at recess, students played games in the town green across around the graveyard, town pond. Some of the games they played seemed to be different versions of tag with names like cross the lake, squat tag, duck on the rock, and 6410. There are some reports of brave students who would risk life and limb to no doubt impress their friends by riding the great arms of the windmill a youth would wait for the arm to near the ground, grab on, and as the huge arms twirled, shift their bodies as to not fall off until they made it all the way around and could hop back to earth, something they probably didn't tell their mothers. <laughs> In the winter, they skated on the pond or went sledding down Mill Hill. Supposedly, the desired run would be down Mill Hill and out across Town Pond. Horace Halick, a student at Clinton Academy from 1819 to 1822, wrote years later, I really love to remember my time there at the Academy, then in its glory, its broad street flanked on either side by well-kept carriage roads carpeted through its center by a fine large grass plot, its flocks of snow-white geese parading through, its streets are floating leisurely upon its two large ponds, its two well-known windmills standing as sentinels on each end of town, its academy, the literary home of so many aspiring youth, its charming ocean beach, where almost daily in the summer and fall, we students would go for a refreshing bath in the pure waters of the Atlantic. The academy might be one of the most dramatic structures within the East Hampton Historic District, reminiscent of 18th century educational buildings modeled after Yale and Harvard campuses. By 1881, the state dissolved the chartered academy system and the school reverted to the trustees. The Dorset Clinton Academy closed and the building was altered significantly. As you can see here, there is a lot of different uh, changes, but well, if you look here, and then I go back, you can see they added this, this wing here and they, uh, the whole porch was closed in to make more room. And it was, it was a community center, it was called Clinton Hall. It was used to house plays, operas, um, you know, they had traveling musicians from all over. It was kind of like a well-known place to come, especially in the, in the summer months for the, uh, the summer vacation uh, city folk. Other sections of the building were rented for music, dancing lessons, art studios, and I believe both East Hampton Star newspaper offices and the Village Library both had their start at Clinton Hall. In 1921, Clinton Academy was restored as accurately as possible to its 1784 appearance, um, and then this was to the Historical Society in 1921. So this is, uh, it was, as we see,
it, today it's brought back to its original um, architecture. All right, finally, a part of today's East Hampton Middle School on Newtown Lane was built in 1893. It was called the Union School. It was originally contained kindergarten through 12th grade. So I believe this was the primary school. Primary school was over here, and then this was the high school over here. This is the Newtown Lane is right here. Um, so part of this building, and I'll mention in a minute, is now part of the, the middle school now. And you can see that familiar red brick. And this is, you're in Herrick Park right now. And you're looking, like where the playground is, you're looking across Newtown Lane to the Union School, where the middle school is now. In 1924, the Union School was largely demolished to make way for the present middle school. The front facade was saved and moved to the intersection of Main Street to become the Veteran of Farns War Building, which today is London Jewelers. So London Jewelers, that the facade, um, part of that was from the, the Union School. I'm not sure exactly what part. It might be uh, it might have been this part. Um, Huey King said they put the, he told me they put on those Doric columns afterwards. I think As the population grew, a separate high school and John Marshall Elementary School were built. Today, the middle school where I teach contains only six, seventh, and eighth grades. So I'm not really sure where the original, but part of that is in there somewhere. <laughs> As the population grew, a separate high school and John Marshall were built. Okay. All districts, so today, all the districts, Montauk, Wayne, Scott Springs, uh, and um, you go to East Ham High School for 9th through 12th grades. And, uh, what's the East Ham High School's mascot? Boniker. Boniker, the waiter wearing, clam raking, wielding Boniker, yeah. <laughs> East Hampton Middle School this year, our motto is knowledge is power. I think our early East Hampton forefathers understood this perfectly. And although they plowed in the field and fished in the bay, they also understood the importance of Researching this topic of early education in East Hampton and digging deep into our town's soul of academia, now I understand even more how important the role of education was here and still is today. Not just from the classroom, but from the family, from the library, from the museum, the entire community, all of us should play a role in the betterment of the future generation in any way we can. I hope you enjoyed this talk and learned something about the history of education in East Hampton and to recite the quote from that plaque in Amagansett, Learn from today, learn from yesterday, live for today, and hope for tomorrow. Thank you very much.